Um, this poor guy. I mean, it must have been a three thousand pound bike. Yeah, well, the thing is, we saw this Chips episode. There's a, t a famous TV show called Chips. And they did an episode where, you know, the, the plot was circled around a, a BMX race in California. I could aerial 360 and hop and all the rest of it. BMX boys have a lot of fun. As I get older, I'll be honest, other than a few aches and pains, and you must know about this with your, your biking history, your BMX in history, other than a few aches and pains, I still think I'm like 15. Yeah, I must admit, I, I suffer that problem a lot. I've been, uh, I've been doing a bit of mountain biking the last sort of six months or so. And I mean, it's been a game changer, but I, I kind of tend to ride like I did 40 years ago. And I've been reminded a couple of times in the last uh, few weeks, in fact, that I'm not quite, you know, you, <laughs> you never forget how to ride a bike. You just become old and fat and it becomes much harder to ride a bike. So I found out to my cost that I'm not as, uh, you know, I, I don't recover as quickly from the uh, little scrapes anymore. So, yeah, well, I was watching that wonderful documentary. Was it called The Boys of Rom? Yeah, Ron Boys. Ron Boys, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, when I saw it, and I saw it being heralded as a legendary documentary, don't miss it, especially if you like BMX, which obviously I, I, with a £1,000 BMX in the garage, I, I still do. Um, but I thought, Ron Boys, is that like CD-ROM or something? <laughs> and then, of course, it's, it's Romford, and it was the original skate park, skate stroke bmx park that kicked well kicked a lot of it off from I'm, i mean i know it came from america but in in this country yeah for sure well rom skate park i mean particularly in my history i mean i mean I'm, we're going back a while but i think you know i first started riding that i think it was launched in 76 so uh that was really where i cut my teeth on a bike i mean i think you know rom and haro skate park i mean that was what taught me how to ride a bmx bike and then when I started racing in 1980, it was kind of, I could, I could really ride a bike already and it kind of, you know, really did me a lot of good. But yeah, Rom's amazing, man. I mean, we did this, uh, you know, I mean, it's out now. It's done really well. Um, and, uh, you know, we did a, an interview for that. And I remember that I borrowed somebody's bike while I was there thinking, yeah, I can ride some of these bowls just like the old days. And um, it was like a, a mega rebuild or, you know, a, a Haro freestyler. Mm. And this poor guy, I mean, it must have been a 3,000 pound bike. And I, I try, I attempted a few times to go out of the, uh, the pool. And I, I must admit, I kind of forgot myself. So I tried this thing three times, bailed three times, nearly wrecked this guy's bike. And it was only after three attempts of falling on the floor, falling on my ass. I kind of looked at this guy and he, I could see he was like, oh, no, that's my bike. Get off, get off. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, and I think, uh, sadly for me, I, I think they included a few shots of me crashing in, the, uh, in that documentary. But, but it's all good. I mean, you know. Andy, just one sec. It was sunny. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, I was, I was watching a documentary thinking, is Andy going to get on a bike? And you did. And you can still that you can still see someone that knows what they're immediately knows what they're doing, even if they don't have the, the prowess that they once did. Oh, thank you. That's a really nice way of putting it. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit, um, it, it was, it's always a shock. I mean, I don't know how to describe it really, because a lot of it is memory. It's right. Like, like I can remember how to ride a BMX bike. But it's like your brain thinks you can still do what you did 40 years ago, but your body just obviously can't. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, do you, it, it's... Do you, think sorry, it can, do you think it can? Because when you see people like Tony Hawk, who are just still yeah. at it, and he's, what, 50? Yeah. I can... I... I don't go out on the bike much. That I, I go on it now because my son's that age where he's got a, a decent little bike. And so we go out, mm. you know, scrambling together. But 
it's like I can still run marathons and stuff now, like even better than when I was younger. And I just wonder if I'll put some time on the BMX, maybe, yeah, get a bit of the old glory back. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll tell you the difference. I think the difference is basically if you've carried on doing it, it's like, you know, people like Eric Roop is still racing BMX bikes now, you know, and I retired from racing in uh, 1987 or something, right? But I've never been on a bike since. So I've got, I've got that whole 30, 40 years where I never rode a bike at all. Um, and I think that's, that's really the difference. I think, you know, with a bit of practice, a bit more practice, you know, I could ride a BMX bike again, I think. Um, but I think the biggest point is that because I've been, you know, partying for 40 years, you know, suddenly jumping back on a BMX bike and trying to launch out the Port Rom on somebody else's, you know, expensive rebuild, you know, it, it, it was, it was fun, but I, I did a bit of damage to myself, to be honest. And I, and I think this is the big difference when you're old. It's like it, it took me three weeks to recover, you know, from the, a few bangs and bruises and, you know, and it took, literally took me three weeks. For the next couple of days, I woke up and I could barely walk. And that was just by doing that. But, but yeah, Ron, Ron, though, has got such a part of BMX history in the UK. Mm. Um, and I'm so proud of everyone that's kind of brought that thing back. You know, they've, they've, they've cleaned it. They've brought it all back. They did a big, uh, big event there the other day. I wish I could have gone. Um, but, uh, I mean, that place has got so many memories, it really has. And it was, as I say, it was part of, you know, before I started racing, I was, I cut my teeth in that place. Um, you know, I did my first aerial 360s in 1978, I think, um, you know, at that ROM skate park. Um, so I'll always remember it. I mean, it's, you know, it's a big piece of history. And I was really proud of that documentary. I mean, it did such a good job. And uh, it's funny, I, I've obviously... You know, it's been a long time since anyone remembered my name. You know what I mean? But it's like since that documentary's come well, out, let, you know, a lot of people. Let me just introduce you to our friends at home then, Andy, because uh, today, folks, sorry, I know I speak slowly at the best of times. It's because I'm always frigging awestruck, not just with my guests and how lucky I am to just chat with all my heroes. But... Also, I'm, I'm just gobsmacked that my life has just turned out so well with all the bloody shenanigans I've got to over the years. So Andy Ruffle was the absolute biggest legend for all of us growing up as teenagers from the age of sort of 14 onwards. Andy and a few other names like Tim March. But to be honest, it was Andy was the biggest name in BMX in for being the most talented rider that the UK, uh, I would say the UK has produced. Andy obviously put the work, the work in himself. And it was, it was just incredible. I mean, there's us. I, I was fairly good, but I never had the equipment. My, my parents, Andy, they, they, they bought me a 15 quid. I thought it was an Amoco, but Amoco is actually quite a good bike. So it can't have been that, but it was this, uh, it, this heavy bloody old thing and we used to yeah. we used to shoplift stuff from Halfords to try to make it a bit 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 more cooler and sure yeah but and there's there's Andy there with this sponsorship deals with the best bikes the best gear um and whereas I could sort of hop over I don't know, something two foot high, or I could I could hop over 11 people when they laid, laid down. There's Andy hopping over a tennis net and, and just taking it to that elite level that, that elite athletes uh, that do. And it's just that magic ingredient that some people have got. And either some people have to really, really work at it or, or they're never going to have it. Sure. So, it's yeah. just brilliant to chat to you, mate. It's just unreal. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. I mean, it's, you know, it's been great. It took us a little while to get this together, but um, it's, no, I'm excited to talk to you. I mean, I, I think especially it's, it's great what you say about the old days because, you know, I, I must admit it's been a long time, but I, I kind of remember and it's like, you know, thinking about, you know, get, getting on, on the video with you and uh, it made me think about the old days and how I got into BMX. Um, and it was, it was basically skateboarding. I tried to be a skater first 
And they they made this big skate park, Skate City. Now, this was the first skate park, I think, in England. It was called Skate City, and it was in central London somewhere. And uh, so I uh, I bought, I, I went in a store, I saved up some money, and I bought this whole skateboard. I mean, it was ridiculous. A piece of wood with some roller skate wheels on it, right? It's like, you know, yeah, that must have been 75, 76, right? So I walk in the store. And uh, bought this bought this skateboard, and I was so proud. I was like the happiest I'd ever been in my life. And I walked out the store, jumped on this skateboard, slipped off immediately, fell on my ass. The skateboard went in the street, and a truck ran it over. And I was like, "Oh, I was like, oh dear, that, that's not good." So I went. I remember I was so upset. I went back in the store, tried to get it to replace it. I said, "Hey, it just broke." He said, "I just saw it get run over by a truck." I'm not replacing it. Anyway, so he wouldn't replace it. But mm -hmm. cut a long story short, I then bought another skateboard and I was all excited. I went down to Skate City. I could skate by that point, I could skateboard. So, I, you know, I was all right. I had a, a, a GNS uh, skateboard, if I remember rightly. And I go to Skate City, line up, get the badge. Uh, I was in the park for about five minutes. Thought, oh, I need to go and take a piss. So I went, I went in the toilet and I put me, board, I stood the board up next to the urinal. Uh, I'm taking a piss. These three guys come up, basically robbed me of my skateboard and ran off, <laughs> ran off outside at out, out the uh, men's room. But it was at that point, really, that I thought, yeah, I'm going to try a different career. So I literally, that's how I got into BMX. I actually wanted to be a skateboarder. Um, and then I basically managed to uh, do up a grifter like we did in the old days. I don't, if, I don't know if you remember grifters, rally grifters. Yes, very much so. That was... Yeah, the they were like the almost like the forerunner. Were well, they? I mean, they were a rally English oh, bike, but yeah, they, yeah, they kind of looked a bit like a BMX, didn't they? Yeah. Well, the thing is, we saw this Chips episode. There's a, t a famous TV show called Chips, and they did an episode where you know the the plot was circled around a, a BMX race in California, and that literally changed everything in the UK. So I, I can't remember exactly when it was. It must have been seventy seven or seventy eight. And we saw that episode and every young kid that was into bike riding had the same thought. We can't buy a BMX bike, so we're going to try and make one. And that's where the Rally Grifter came in and we put orange mug guards on it and bigger handlebars. And but sadly, as soon as we tried to jump, the forks would break. And, you know, so that was really the start for a lot of us. Um, you know, and it was because of that TV show in uh, 1977. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it was a, an interesting route for me anyway to get into the bmx bikes but i guess it was fate yeah i mean i actually i had a rally a normal bike if i won't even say a road bike because young people today will think i mean like a really carbon fight no we're talking sure, yeah. like like almost like a granddad's bike and i just took out i took all the mud guards off stripped everything off we used to make these ramps that looking back were just kamikaze i mean they were ridiculous sure. we used to yeah, make yeah. them out of breeze blocks and, and wood from dad's get you know our dad's or stepdad's garage and coming down the road i've got it i've got it and you was lucky if your wheel didn't come off in midair and then exactly, you, yeah. you know <laughs> um so yeah i mean i feel then, you and then the big thing do you remember et the effect of course that yeah, yeah. No, I mean that—that that was really the second, second wave. I mean, uh, from uh, Kuhara did the, uh, the the BMX bike, and uh, yeah, I mean that was—I mean that must have been eighty three then, I guess, or maybe you know eighty three, eighty four. But yeah, it was—it was you know that made a big difference too. But I think you know I, I was kind of in the right place at the right time to a certain extent. But I my career became what it became because I could do both things. I could do the the trick riding. I mean, going back to the Rum skate park thing. I could aerial 360 and hop and all the rest of it before I even rode an actual BMX. Well, that's, that's not fair. No, I mean, I, 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 meant it, I bought a Super Goose, and that's what I rode over the parks. But it was two years before the first race took place. So I'd already done all, you know, I'd cut my teeth in the skate parks and all the rest of it. And that, that's actually what made a difference in my career because, you know, the, I had great sponsors who paid me a lot of money at the time, and it was because I could show up at a, you know, a bike store in Nottingham and do a, a 40 minute, you know, BMX demo, um, and then put the bike in the car, drive to Carlisle and do a BMX race. So I think, you know, I played on that a bit. I was kind of, you know, I was lucky that I could do both things. Yes. It was always the thing, wasn't it? Freestyle and racing. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I often, I mean, I, I, I was actually talking to some people about this the other day. I, I wasn't really, I felt like I should have been a freestyler as opposed to a racer, but it was the racing at that point that was, you know, making me money. So <laughs> it was like, I, you know, I, I mean, I loved the racing thing. Um, you know, I, I, it took me all around the world, but it was, it's, 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 if I'm, I'm, if I'm honest with myself now, 40 years later, it's like, well, you know what, maybe I was a freestyler really. Um, but to be honest, by, by 87, 88 you know it was um i kind of had enough of both really and then sort of moved on but um what a what a few years though i mean you know it, it was you know some some weird things happened it's like i used to do a lot of tv right so i'd uh i'd i'd, I'd get on a tv show and uh, and most I, I did 550 tv appearances i think in a, in a couple of years all around the world but i mean you know uk and europe and uh and i remember that i used to go on these shows and they'd do an interview and I'd do some front ops and some back ops and, you know, which were a thing then. I mean, you know, people laugh now when it's doing all these front ops. Um, and so uh, there was this one occasion where uh, I, I get the phone call. Okay, can you uh, go to Carlisle on uh, Saturday and do this TV show? So I was like, yeah, great, whatever. So, uh, you know, I didn't even think about it. So I show up in Carlisle and they're booking me a hotel room. They booked me a hotel room. I thought, well, this is weird. Um, so I stay in the hotel room the next day I'm thinking to do this appearance on a TV show. Um, but it was BMX beat and it was the first, first series of BMX beat. And I remember I showed up all of a sudden there's a thousand kids in a car park, uh, at, at border television. And, uh, the producer handed me a microphone and said, right, uh, well, the first competitor's coming on in, in a couple of minutes, off we go. And I was like, well, hang on a minute. What do you want me to do? <laughs> So <clears throat> all of a sudden, you know, I was sort of co-hosting this TV show on network TV. Um, uh, and I didn't even realize it was a TV show, you know, a, a TV series. I just thought I was going to make an appearance, do some front ops and, and leave. Um, but that was a big turning point for me because that show became so popular. I mean, it was incredible. Um, you know, it was on ITV on Saturday mornings. And I did seven series of six episodes in the end. So... And then they let me host it myself by the end. You know, by 87, I was, I was hosting it myself. So, what channel, um, but yeah. What channel did that go out on? Um, ITV, Saturday mornings from 19... I think I did the first season in 1984. And the, we did the last ones in 1988. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was... I mean, that was a bit of a life changer, that show. Yes. Uh, it, it definitely, you know, it, and it got more viewers than Saturday Superstore on the BBC um so that was uh yeah it was, it was incredible um but yeah so it's things like that that you know luckily i was able to you know i'm from east london so i can talk a bit and um i didn't find it that hard to do but it was one of the most scary moments ever in my life I was standing there in front of a thousand kids with a microphone and i'm um, got to talk about and introduce people and you know alistair p was the co-host um r.a.p you were good like that though because I mean, the same sort of era was Eddie Kidd as well, wasn't it? That's right. Yes. And he yes, was a fellow, was he fellow Londoner or that kind of. Yeah. 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 He's, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I actually met him a few times um, in those days. I mean, mainly because we did the same, sometimes we'd be on the same TV show. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, he was one of my, I mean, I've never really had heroes as such, but but Eddie Kidd, man, he was absolute brilliant. And it, I mean, it's a shame. I, I mean, I don't know if you know, he had a little accident, and uh, you know that kind of put his riding career to an end. Um, but yeah, I mean, people like Eddie, uh, amazing. You know, and I, I was I was privileged to meet him. Uh, that's for sure. Actually, we were on Facebook. We we kind of mess each other every now and then. Message each other oh, um, cool. every now and then. So yeah, yeah, no, it's, it was yeah that era. Um, yeah. So yeah, ex exciting times. He had a he had a ride off, didn't he, or a jump off with uh, Evil Knievel's son? That's, yeah, Robbie Knievel. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Actually, yeah, I think that was a little later, so that must have been late eighties, I guess. Um, back in the day when they had these heavy old bikes, and and I think what they're four strokes or whatever, and and yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah. have the suspension that they get, or even Harley's. Yeah, well, Evil yeah. Knievel used to ride a Harley, so. But yeah, th those were the days. But I th but I think it's it was all, all part everything in those days. Everything was pioneering to a certain extent. It is now, but it's like you know the fact that um, you know doing doing front ops. I mean, you know, I mentioned it before. Doing front ops in 1981 was a thing. 
Do you know what I mean? It was like, wow, you know, I used to do these shows all the time. I do front ops, back ops, and you know, 360 and whatever. And um, you know, so there was a lot of stuff that um I, I I'm happy to say I kind of did first. Um, you know, I I did uh I, I'm sure. You know, I got a couple of world records for a little while. I mean, people beat them, you know, pretty soon after. But, you know, the height record. And I, and I remember in, in Ireland, they did a whole TV show, me going for the world record for bunny hopping people, um, you know, and, I mean, basically hopping over people laying on the floor without a ramp. Hey, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. It wasn't called a bunny hop. It was called a ruffle hop. Oh, that's... <laughs> Come on. Oh, no, wait. No, wait, wait, wait. That was no. You're thinking about the ruffle hop drop. Oh, it's raining. The ruffle way, hop. But... Ruffle, ruffle hop was front wheel up and then back wheel and then down. The bunny that's hop, right. Well, look, bunny hop was both wheels at the same time, right? Yeah, that's right. So, but uh, so in terms of what we were doing in this this TV show, it was basically I ended up doing about thirty six or thirty eight people laying on the floor, um, and I had to take a run up. I mean, much like Evil Can Evil, used to take a run up from the other side of the, the hall. It was at the King's Hall in Belfast. And I had to, you know, do this big run up, you know, as flat out as I could go. And I ended up doing about 36 or 38 people. Um, so, yeah, I was, I, was, I was quite, quite pleased with that. And, um, yeah, I know you're thinking of ruffle hop drop. That was, that was going up the quarter pipe on your front wheel, spinning around 180 and then hopping back in without your back wheel touching the top of the ramp. I, I think this is probably something that, that, People named it this, but maybe you never knew. No, the ruffle hop was always the front wheel up and then hop the back wheel so you could... Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I mean, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but yeah. The one, the one you just said, the people on the ground, it was the same ruffle hop. You just had to have more speed up to do it. And you. And it That's was, right. It was a real quicker... Yeah, yeah. And it was a long way too. It was, I, actually, it was the first time I kind of got a little bit scared because I used to do, you know, hopping people all the time um, at shows, but I'd always do like 12, 14 people. And then this time I was going for like 36 and I actually pulled, I remember pulling up on the bike, you know, there's a fairly big crowd there too. And it was the first time I actually got a bit nervous because I looked at how long, you know, this distance was, and it's really about speed. The more speed you get, the further you can go, obviously it's like jumping anything. But um, no, I must admit that was the first time I was a little bit nervous, but I mean, I pulled it off. And uh, then the, uh, the, the there was a, a young lady journalist on the end. Um, sorry, I've got a pig. I've got a pig here. He's kind of biting my feet. Right now. I thought it was a. It sounded like a chicken. No, it's a it's a pig. I thought I'd locked him away, but anyway. Um, so sorry about the noise, the squawking noise. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and it was it was funny because uh, it was a journalist from the Telegraph that was on the end of this thing. So she really took her life in her hands because she was on on their last. And uh, once I pulled it off, I remember you know we went out to dinner and you know we ended up uh, dating for a while. So that's one hell of a way to to, to meet a new girlfriend. <laughs> well, let let's talk about that. There's so much I'd, I'd want to ask you, Andy, but mm. it. it you you're a young guy what was it i mean you you must have been hero worship wherever you went or at least everyone wanted an autograph or to say hello what what what's it like what was that like at that age well it was kind of um well, well put it this way the, the best way to describe it is i think certain things happened while i was riding bmx bikes that kind of um let's let's say took me to another level and i'll give an example of what i mean by that um in 90 i think it was 83 and 84 um i took part in a tv show on the bbc um uh, called superstars or super teams and it was a big show right so this thing gets 20 million 21 million views you know each year they they hold a tournament it's basically uh, uh, athletes against athletes and you do all kinds of different disciplines and um so one of the disciplines is riding a bicycle, like a, a, a road racing bicycle, right? And it's a relay. So there's like me, I don't know, I'm trying to remember some of the names, but big, big athletic stars at the right. time. And was I was always, a, always Kevin Keegan was good at it, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. And, and I think the, the, the famous guy was Brian Jacks, who used to win all the time. Um, he would, but So I, I basically went on this show, and I must have been 16. So I was, I was the youngest person ever to... Uh, 
get off um to ever ever to uh, take part in it anyway cut a long story short so of course there's this big build-up oh here's andy ruffle the bmx star you know well, obviously he's gonna do well because it's a cycling event so i literally when it came to my turn i jumped on the bike and i'd never experienced uh clip pedals right so the pedals i mean i just had no clue so of course i put my foot on the pedal a jump on the bike and it was on the clip side one side was a pedal one side was a clip so i literally put my foot on the clip slid off foot went in the front wheel i went over the handlebars and landed on the on the road like that <laughs> and uh so i managed to get back on the bike and pulled it it pulled it back a bit but that 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 obviously suddenly i couldn't walk down the street after that went out it's like, it was either, ah, oh, that's the Andy Ruffle fell off the bike. Or it was like, ah, oh, that's Andy Ruffle. Yeah, I saw him on Super Teams the other day. Superstar, uh, Super Teams, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so that gives you an idea of how, you know, I went from being famous in certain circles, you know, if you're a BMX fan or, you know, generally you'd see me on TV a couple of times. But all of a sudden, you know, this was a different level. This was literally like having a number one record. So I, I, you know, that changed everything. I, I couldn't walk down the street without, you know, being chased for autographs and stuff like that. So that was a big game changer. And then the other one was, um, I hosted a, a co-hosted a TV show uh, called the Frosty's BMX Championship. And I think that was on Channel Four. So that 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 was a huge show as well. And then we have this classic scenario where the producers said it'd be a great idea to have a segment. In each show, there was like six or eight shows in each show, and it would be called Ruffles Race Tips. So I remember this particular occasion, we're in up north somewhere doing this big race, and we're basically we're racing the Americans. So I do this Ruffles Race Tip, and it's like, okay, this is it now. We're, we're just getting ready for the race. Make sure everything's tight. Must make, a, make sure everything's tight. So, of course, I literally went to the pedals with a, a spanner or a wrench, and I, I did the pedals up. So, of course, five minutes later, I go up on the track to race. I get on the gate, gate drops. My pedal falls off, right? And this is national TV again. So, of course, after that, you know, another sort of, you know, number one <laughs> moment, pop star moment. Uh, and I couldn't live that one down. That one was much tougher to live down because it actually happened during a BMX race. So, um, is that and then there's all all kinds of conspiracies about Tim March loosening my pedal and all that kind of stuff. That was great media, but man, I couldn't go anywhere without, you know, it took me a long while to live that down. Was that hard though? Because at that age, you're quite self-conscious as a young man, aren't you? You know, you're worried about your hair and well, you know, when we had hair, when I had uh, it. But, well, but, yeah, listen, I've, lo I've looked at some of the pictures from back then. I don't think I cared about my hair that much, to be honest, but you're right. I know what you mean. Um, I, I was lucky, I guess, because it, 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 it didn't bother me, none of that stuff, to be honest. Um, I think I was just uh, lucky in that because I, I, because I didn't have time to think about it, I think is what was really happening. For, from 1980, 1980 to 1985, 1986, I didn't stop. You know, I never, I never, never had a day off. It was like, you know, so I, it just naturally happened and I didn't have time to think about what was going on. So, And we made a record as well, which called bmx boys have a lot of fun yes um, yeah I'm and uh, i'm actually <laughs> i'm actually actually I, I just put up the video to that i found well, i found the video the music video to it and i think this is like 1982 or 1983 no it must be 83 and uh it's called bmx boys have a lot of fun uh and we really had a lot of fun actually you know doing this because i'm actually singing on it right a lot of people don't realize but i am actually in there somewhere on, on singing it um so things like that and that, that track did really well you know that that it, it made the charts and um i remember you know, it you know it's a bmx boys have a lot of fun so yeah and, and i just found i've, I've got a, a a youtube channel called stunt the biker it's on stunt and uh i just found a music video to it so that's that's been getting lots of laughs um because we, we just posted it like last week or a couple of weeks ago um so yeah but i mean you know what other sport can you do where you end up making records traveling the world you know and and, and being treated like a pop star <laughs> it was like yeah I'm, I'm bring it on bring it on well I, I, I don't know what what i'm more curious about the the girls or the bikes 
let's go let's go with something less tacky and let's start with bikes yeah what was it like to have the best equipment at your disposal and, and sponsors paid for it well it, it depends what stage of my career i was at i mean for instance when i, I started racing in 1980 i did my first race october 1980 right mm. And the second one in November, I was lucky I won, right? I won my age group because uh, I, was, I was 14, I guess, 13 or 14. But within a few months, you know, when BMX really started to take off, you know, Mongoose, Malcolm Jarvis, who's still, you know, one of the greatest people ever, um, he uh, was bringing in mongoose, mon mongoose, mongooses. Um, and it, it was amazing because for the first, you know, so basically – He's, they sponsored me. And what that involved at the time was uh, giving me a bike um, and and they took me to the races, right? Because they had a team van, whatever. So that was 19, that was the beginning of 1981. So I won a few more races at the beginning of 81 and then other people were interested in sponsoring me. And that's when, you know, I get the call from Malcolm, come down to the warehouse, blah, 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 let's have a chat. And um as part of that discussion, this is, this is, this has got to be mid 81, I think. And this was one of the greatest moments I remember because I, I was, I was a very poor kid, right? I didn't have much at all. So it was such a revelation. I go down to the warehouse. We agreed that, you know, they're going to carry on sponsoring me and they've, they've made it worthwhile for me, not big money or anything, but they've made it worthwhile. So I was going to get paid to do shows and, you know, various other things. And, uh, oh, and they bought, they bought me a car. Right. So, uh, but the greatest thing was Malcolm took me to the warehouse, opened the doors and said, take what you want. <laughs> and this was unbelievable. It was like, so I remember literally walking around the warehouse. Oh, I need some bars. Oh, oh I need two pairs of bars. Uh, uh, okay. I need that. And I, I, need, I need some grips and I need this. And I created this big giant box of stuff. And of course I had no way to get it home because at that, that point I didn't have a car or anything. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was incredible because I'd never experienced anything like that. You know, I'd always like everyone else. I've been looking in the magazines, you see Harry Leary, Eddie King, Stu Thompson and all this gear and, and uh, you know, you want to live up to that, but mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to walk around and grab everything you want. I mean, it was like, I don't know, it was Christmas times a million, you know? So, so it depends what, what part of my career I was at because, you know, by the time 1985 rolled around and I was being paid a lot of money I, I honestly getting a few frames and bits and pieces obviously didn't you know didn't wasn't that important um but it was uh, but yeah so i think in those early days you know to be able to pick up a ton of gear and you know have all the flash stuff uh, and not have to pay for it was was you know amazing i mean that was the turning point of my career i guess did you have a different bike did you have a freestyle bike and a racing bike no, I mean, there's always been a lot of discussion about, I, use, I always ran two brakes, so, um, which was unusual, I guess. I think most, most BMX racers at any level, you know, just rode a back brake. Uh, but the reason, there was no secret, it wasn't, it wasn't like a racing um, hack or anything. It was just basically that I'd, I would literally pack my bags after doing a race. The next day, I'd be in a city somewhere to do a show. Mm. And, I, and to do a show, I needed two brakes, so, you know. That, that was basically it. So um, I forgot what your question was, but yeah, basically yeah. It, was, uh, it was a standard bike. So I didn't have a freestyle bike as such. I just had one race bike and I used to do everything on it. The, the reason I ask is I, when I built my Harrow, um, I was in this kind of um, nostalgic dream world that i'm building my dream bike this is gonna be it's all it's gonna be all do you remember the tough neck stem it was of course every, yeah, yeah everyone wanted a tough neck stem yeah the the, the the straight bars and everything that well, i think they were called harrow bars weren't they anyway mm. so i went to town and because i was older i was about 35 when i built this bike and i had a few quid in the bank so money wasn't really a a, a big issue i just bought what yeah. i wanted <sighs> What I'm getting to is, by the time I built this Harrow Freestyler, it weighed a bloody ton. <laughs> and when yeah. my mates, when we were teenagers, they were all sponsored because they were good. They were a few of them were good, really good racers. Mm. 
and their racing bikes weighed like the frame would weigh six pounds or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And from a freestyle perspective, it was a, you can do a lot more on a bike that weighs half it's less. what, what, what yeah. you know, you can't jump yeah. it over a car cause you're going to snap it in half maybe, but when it yeah. comes to the front ops, the three sixties, all this kind of stuff that that's, you can tell I, <laughs> tell I've got an interest because yeah yeah I mean no I mean I, I know exactly what you mean I mean, it, it's, it's like it's almost it's like the other day I was in Oklahoma um, and we went to a local BMX race and I was with uh, Cash Matthews who I love he's, he's brilliant and um, so I, I managed to get a ride on a on a, on a modern BMX bike and, I, and it freaked me out because first of all exactly like you say it's so light and the geometry has changed now. It's like with, with our bikes in, 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 uh, in our era or, or my era, um, you know, we had dirt corners and you literally go around a corner and you have to stick your foot out, right? Just basic things like this. And then the new bike, you could actually point it into a corner and it would just go around the corner, right? But it, but it weighed so little, it was just completely alien to me because he's, he's so used to having a bit of weight under you um so and, I, and so you're absolutely right i mean the modern bikes but i mean the new freestyle the, the, the freestylers of today number one they don't use brakes no brakes and i'm like okay mind blown um and they're, they're actually not that light that i mean I, I managed to ride one probably six months ago um when i, when I was uh, i was visiting dale holmes and this guy had a, a, a modern freestyle bike and it just had no brakes but it that was a little bit heavier but um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's light years away now to what it used to be in, like in the old days, you know? Yeah, who's the guy that – is it Ryan on the X Games? Is, is Ryan it, Nyquist? Say again? Ryan Nyquist? Uh, no, let me just – Or you mean, you mean the modern guy, the, the guy he, that's uh, – The youngish guy and he's got a nickname. <coughs> uh, I don't know. I, I saw the guy the other day uh, – Garrett, is it? Um, who's actually a scooter rider, and he was like doing triple backflip, flare, three sixty somersault, whatever. Um, I mean that that just blows my mind. I mean I can't even begin to fathom how they do that shit. Yeah, there's Ryan Nyquist. Is 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 it Ryan Williams? They call him Big Willie or Little Willie? Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's that's the guy I mean. He's the scooter guy. He's, he can ride oh, the scooter. Oh, the dude's insane! Unbelievable. Mm. I mean, they will fall off. Totally mental. They'll fall on their ass, and they're doing bit. They're getting big air. Yeah, yeah, falling on. They're literally falling off those bikes time and time and time and time yeah. again. Yeah, they're. Um, yeah, but the, te the technology has changed a lot as well. Um, it's like there's. A, I, I always remember, and he and he does it. I'm actually gonna get involved in making that. We're making a documentary about Jose Yanez, right? And um, he did. There was a movie called Rad. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, and that must have been '84, I think, something like that. And that was when the very first backflip was done on a BMX bike. Um, so I guess that was '84. But he doesn't. He, he's not getting any like respect for it. It's like you know he and he did it on a motorcycle as well in 1984 or 85. But nobody knows. So you know, he's an amazing guy. So um, we're going to do a documentary about it. But I'll tell you more about that when we've we've done it. Yeah, I mean that's another of my another of my favorite athletes, Travis Pastrana. Oh um, yeah! Oh my god! You know what? what Legends. What, what a legend! I'm, I've been watching some of his stuff lately, and his his legs are so busted up. They just yeah. He's had, he's had a few. He's had a few injuries. Um, but no. But but I think it, it's it's you know it's amazing to me. I you know, I used to ride BMX bikes, but it, it's like the the transition and the way things have improved. And I think a lot of it's to do with what I said earlier. It's like. I spent 20, 30 years and never even looked at a bicycle. So, you know, to suddenly come back into it and then see what's going on now, it's like going in a time machine and, you know, scooting forward, you know, to another another level. But, yes, yeah, so um, they're, they're all amazing. I watched Travis, actually. I'm actually at Supercross these days, like, like motorcycle Supercross. Um, big fan of that, the American Supercross. Um, so yeah, you know, I've been following some of these guys, Travis, I've been following for a while cause he's just another level genius. That's it. And people like Matt Hoffman, those kind of guys. I wish I could put it in it, words. Don't do it justice. 
it's a bit like the rave era, the dance era, trying to explain that to a youngster now. Yes. Who, <laughs> you know, I, might... was, I was part of that era. I, I threw a few raves in 1990 or whenever it was. Well, there you go, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's still, you know, can we call them bits and pieces? You know, youngsters go out and yeah. do stuff on a night out, etc. But it's it's a different feeling to what to back then. And the BMX, when you came out of that cinema and watched ET, mm. those young lads, they've you know they've they, they got the police chasing them, and they're jumping over cars and and all, and they yeah. don't they don't give a damn, you know. They're going to rescue this, save this little alien. And you saw these bikes. These just the coolest bikes that you'd ever seen in your life. And you yeah. jump over things on them. And you came out of that cinema. Like, I, I've got to have one of them. I've got, you could see yeah. it just fueled the craze. And it was a craze. It was, it was yeah. great. And we lived to get on our bikes. That was it. We just that lived to yeah. get on our bikes and, and, Whereas these days you might get someone that gets into BMX, they go to the skate park, they meet like-minded people and they, they do a few tricks and like, I get that. I, and, and, and let's not take anything away from that. It's brilliant. But no one is ever going to know what it was like for us. No, right that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, it's same as the, uh, you know, same electronic music now compared to doing raves, you know, those, those years ago. But yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, but but I, I'm lucky in a way because I mean, I, I go to the Hall of Fame every year in um, in uh, San Diego, and I've reconnected with everyone that was riding at the same time I was. You know, people like Eddie King, um, Stu Thompson, Mike Miranda, all those kind of guys, the American BMX racers. And uh, there's no doubt about it that, that that group of people in that era, you know, from not just from England or US, it, from from Europe too. You know, that, that it was a certain type of person, right? Because they were pioneers. We were we was all pioneers. We were all pioneers, um, and that's still to this day. We we have something in common, a bond that you know it, it's very difficult to reproduce. I mean, I guess you know there's other ways you can you can build that kind of bond with people, but we were all pioneers, um, and and even to this day, it still feels like that. So it's just an incredible period in human history, and man, it's going to be part of it, you know. Did you ever have a manager, Andy, to sort, you know, to get you the best sponsorship deals and stuff? Yeah. Um, yes, I did. Um, I think probably from 84, uh, maybe 83. A guy called Adam Rushton, who's brilliant. He, he, was, he was responsible for bringing the Tour de France into the UK. You know, they used to do a, a segment in the UK for the Tour de France. I don't know if they still do that, but that was anyway, a bit, guy called Adam. That was a bit in the rain, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember what happened a long time ago. But, uh, yeah, Alan was um, – it, it made a big difference for me because, you know, when I went from Mongoose uh, to Rally, um, you know, Alan was instrumental in, in putting that together. I mean, for instance, when we, when we was negotiating that deal – and I was, on, I was on top of the game then. So, you know, I was a TV star, BMX racer, BMX freestyler, um, and I got more PR than anyone in the history of cycling. Um, apparently, I've been told. But um, UK cycling. But so, yeah, he was, he was, it was great. Cause I mean, to give an example, we walked into the rally to, to negotiate the deal and I could just sit there. He did all the talking. So I, I just sat there and looked important. And then I'd like, he'd look at me and I'd go, <laughs> so we did the whole negotiation like that. So it was brilliant. And it turned out to be a very good deal. Um, so, um, yeah, so he, he made quite a big difference actually. Um, and he also looked after the Kellogg series, so that that also helped. Um, so yeah, you know, it, it was uh, it was brilliant. It, it really made a difference. I mean, I think is it was like after 80, 85, You know, BMX basically took a little bit of well, it took a big dive to be honest, and that's kind of when I sort of retired. I think really eighty six, eighty seven, um, and uh, yeah, but no, he was good. I mean, it, it, it worked. You know, but but I mean, I think I. Overall, um, it may it probably it, it doubled what I could have earned. Put it that way, by having a manager that was that knew what he was doing, you know. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big factor. What were you spent? Were you were you making a lot? Were you, were you spending a lot? What? what how? Well, I mean, I I did well. You know, I bought a couple of houses, but I found I was seventeen. Um, but which was tough in those days because. Um, 
it was you know so anyway but it was good i mean i i, I had to sell them because i'm an entrepreneur so you know I, I think once i did the whole shot event um where we you know bringing over americans and you know getting sued by london underground because one of the skaters um was in victoria station i think and he he fell off his skateboard and it went in the rails as a train was coming in he decided to jump in the rails and pick his skateboard out so the train did an emergency stop and i got sued so uh that that really screwed me actually because that that lawsuit lasted about three bloody years so that must have been 80 that might have even been 85 and then i'd other stuff as well like you know when, you, when you're being an entrepreneur, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and you get the unexpected. But, you know, the, I had various people brought over from uh, other countries uh, and, you know, they'd, do th- you know, they'd set fire to the hotels and stuff like that. So, you know, so that was a, that was a big learning curve. Um, and it, it kind of – I've always been an entrepreneur, but that, that was a hell of a time because I was racing, freestyling, doing stuff, and trying to run the whole shot event which was great. One of the greatest things I've ever done that whole shot event. And, um, but boy, did I learn the hard way, you know, it's, uh, it's, it put me in good stead for doing other stuff. Mm. That's, that's probably how I describe it, but it was a crazy time. Uh, I forgot on what your original question was. I've dive, dive, well, dived, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of, I guess what I'm alluding to is you make so much money. So young, with, we're all young and stupid back then, you know, it's, it's, it's not like that nest egg is probably going to last you too long. Um, but did it kind of stand you in a, in good stead later in life to understand money and, 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 and because you're, you're, you're in media now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I kind of always have been, well, I guess since BMX days, um, I mean, I, I co-created the mobile awards in England. And um, that was a hell of an adventure. Uh, I sold out of that in 2000. Then I created another show called uh, the World Electronic Music Awards, uh, which I sold to 54 countries, that that show. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I went on to do media stuff. Um, And, uh, I mean, I think when I left BMX, um, two of my most amazing friends is uh, Nick Scott and Ed Reisman uh, from a company called Big Group. And uh, it was it was actually hilarious how I met Nick because this must have been eighty seven, and I ju- I'm just going through this lawsuit with London Transport. And uh, anyway, I get this phone call, and it's like, "Is Andy, is Andy Ruggles there?" So I'm like, "No, nah. um, don't know, mate. No, sorry." Anyway, phone keeps ringing. I said, "Look, I'm Andy Ruffle. How can I help you?" He said, "Oh, well, uh, I'm calling on behalf of Nick Scott. He'd uh, like to be your manager." And I was like, "Well, look, I've already got a manager." um thanks very much but anyway cut a long story short i ended up meeting nick uh for lunch in uh, in london somewhere and we the lunch carried on till like midnight but um but we got on really well now he had a, a fairly large production company um and cut a long story short i agreed to make my office at their office and then all of a sudden over you know six months or so i, I end up you know, being co-producer on British Airways in Fly Entertainment. So I've always had that connection. Even after the BMX thing, I didn't really have a period where I was wondering what to do. I just, it just kind of happened. I ended up doing British Airways in Fly Entertainment for a couple of years and then, you know, did some other stuff as well. I mean, I used to do cruise ship movies. So I did two years on cruise ships, uh, traveling the world on cruise ships, did all that. Um, and then Mobile Awards, Dark Star, and uh, then I moved when- to America in 2000. When you're on a cruise ship, how do people react when you said I'm Andy Ruffle? And they they obviously knew who you were. Well, uh, well, that didn't add to, to be honest, didn't happen because on uh, the, let's just say the demographic in those days on cruise ships, you know, weren't necessarily the demographic yeah. that followed BMX. But so, you know, sometimes they'd have kids on board, and 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 they would know from you know UK crews. Um, so yeah, that, that 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 didn't really. And and to be honest with you, by that point, it must have been 1990 two or something so you know I, bmx for me I, even i didn't remember i used to ride bmx bikes by 1992 you know mm. um so that never happened much but it, it does happen i mean even you know up until recently you know i was in an elevator in la in a in a in a building you know two years ago some guy gets in the elevator said hang on a minute are you that bmx kid i'm like how, how do you recognize me when i've <laughs> 
I mean, you know, put on a few pounds. I mean, you know, I've had a good 55 years, you know. Mm. Um, and it was like, and he recognized me. He, he obviously used to live in England, blah, blah, blah. And here I am in Elevate. And he remembered me. And I was like, wow. You know, that, that was really, that was quite something. Mm. Um, but yeah, so, you know, during that whole time, it never really came up. You know, um, I was more famous for the, the MOBA Awards, really, at that point than, you know, uh, BMX at the time. Plus, I never shouted about it. It's like I didn't, you know, unless oh, you lived that era. How is it then um, li- living in in the states? I mean, it's a big it's a big difference to to East London. Yeah, um, yeah. I was born in Bromley, funnily enough. So, oh wow, right, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Kent, I mean, right? Bromley, Bromley, Kent. Yeah. Or Brom, because I think there's another Bromley up north, isn't there? But I'm figuring you you're Bromley, Kent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how did you obviously like it there is what i'm i'm trying trying to say or or do you yeah. do, or do or do you suffer it god no i've always been an american oh man i mean i i should, i feel like i've been i was born in america and somehow ended up in uh, in england no i mean i you know i love england but i've always been you know i, I think america suits my personality i've always been a, a risk taker and adventurer you know, I've I've never been out of staying plum one place very long anyway. Um, but no, I mean, I I I've, I've been coming to the states since I was fourteen or fifteen years old. Um, so it was just a natural thing for me. Didn't even think about it. It's like okay, I'm moving in now full time. Yeah. So and and it, well, the dance, the dance star awards gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, we invested a lot of money, and and part of that was that we're going to launch the show in the states as well, uh, which we did in Miami. Um, and I've been here ever since. So I actually live in Vegas. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, actually, I live in Miami right now, but um, I live in Vegas mostly, mostly. Um, but I yeah, like, I like Florida. I, I, <laughs> I, I really. What's like, not to like? What's yeah, not to like? I really love Amer- uh, Americans. Full stop. But um, it's uh, oh my god! If we're taking, can we say certain things in in this country? like from the media mm. i know in the states it's even more like that and for free spirits like me it's just oh god come on yeah, it's i mean I t- i'll tell you a story when i when i moved to america in 1999 i think it was right i, I remember they just introduced um I'm, i don't want to talk about politics or anything but i just just to give you an example um i i said to uh a couple of people asked me, it's like, well, why, why are you moving? You're doing so well here, man. And I'm like, well, here's why. Because you know that they just introduced a speed camera. Uh, I said, it won't be long before the whole country, every 20 yards, of, and you'll be, you'll be getting so many tickets, you'll lose your license every day. And, I, and everybody laughed. It's like, no, 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 it's, it's for safety. It's for safety. So, I mean, I, I'm just trying to give you an idea. that In terms of my personality, Looking at speed, you know, people can agree with speed cameras, and that's not my point. My point is, once I felt, I felt hemmed in, right? Mm. Speed cameras, oh no, this, that, oh shit. Um, so, you know, but in America, even now, to be honest, it's still a bit, it's a lot freer than it is in, in England. Um, and that's not a political statement. I just mean that, you know, America, that's why America suits me. Plus, it's a lot bigger. You know, it's a six hour flight to go from one side to the other. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, that, that in terms personality wise, America suited me much better. Yes. OK, before we we finish up, I've, I've got to ask you. So what what was the hardest trick that you ever had to learn or, or the most dangerous? Blimey. Um that's a really good point. I, I don't, but again, it depends on what era. When, when I, the, the most dangerous one when I first started riding BMX bikes was Aerial 360 out of, you know, out of Skate Park Bowl. Because, um, you know, you've got lots of opportunities to, to crash, and I did, I guess. But I mean, as far as I know, I was one of the first to do it um, in the world. Um, but that, I, I guess I had the most crashes trying to figure that one out. Um, but then once I got it, I got it. It was, it was actually quite easy in the end. Um, but you know, so yeah, I guess that was dangerous. Um, anything in a skate park, dangerous. Uh, I've had a few, few bad crashes in racing, but I never broke a bone. I never, never injured I've, to this day, touch wood, although I nearly did on the mountain bike a couple of weeks ago. But, um, 
yeah, you know, I never broke bone or anything. So, but everything's dangerous. But you know, if you, <laughs> I was going to say if you know what you're doing, but when when you're 55, it becomes a lot more difficult. But but yeah, so to answer your question, I don't know. A lot of a lot of it was dangerous. There's actually things that probably didn't look dangerous that were actually more dangerous. But let me tell you, going down a start straight with Tim March, Trevor Robinson, who are twice my size, right, banging you know, banging elbows with them at, you know, 40 miles an hour on a downhill BMX track. That was, that was probably the most scary, um, I think, you know. Oh, so, yeah, bad. but it's all good for them. And living in, in Las Vegas then, do you, do you, can I be really cheesy and say, do you, do you get to meet any stars or, or, or obviously, with the exception of looking in the mirror, I mean, other stars... Well, Chris, obviously, this is the highlight of my decade is is meeting you again on on screen. Obviously, I mean, I have to say that first. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I've been lucky because you know, doing the Mobile Awards, I met every major pop star. Doing the Dance Star Awards, I met you know everybody from Madonna to you know big DJs. Avicii, I worked with Avicii for about six years doing music videos for him, and uh, so you know. I, I don't know. Occasionally you do. I mean, but it, but it's not something that um, I, I would think about so much now. You know what I mean? I, I guess when you're younger and you meet a, a film star or whatever you like, mm. you know. But um, you know, I, I I dated a Bond girl once, so it's like you know. After that, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Did you say a Bond girl? Yeah. I I, yeah. I was I was hoping you I was hoping you said a blonde girl. I was going to say I can that as well. <laughs> yeah. Done that twice. Yeah, blonde. Maybe blonde girl's my favourite. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Avicii, that was really sad because he was quite some cool dude, wasn't he? Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. I mean, I was lucky. I actually shot his first uh, video in the US when he first came to the US. I think that must have been 2010 or 20, I don't know, 2209. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I was lucky that I saw him grow, you know, from being. You know, a little bit nervous. I think most people that are familiar with Avicii, you know, see him now, you know, see him recently, the last few years, God rest his soul. Um, but it, the way he changed over time was amazing. And I was lucky because I got to experience seeing Avicii just become this amazing, you know, guy that, that honestly, I, I was damn privileged to work with him because he's a genius, no doubt about it, you know, musically and everything else. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so, but that was, Part of the reason I was in Vegas because it's where you know most electronic music was kind of based, you know, or, or it's, it's basically the capital of world entertainment. So, you know, that was my uh, ambitious goal was to set up our production company there, which we did, and you know, it was very successful. Um, but yeah, so Avicii is, is a particular favorite of mine because I, I got to work with him so much, mm. um, you know, but so, that's part well, of the reason. In your mind, Andy, was there anything suspicious about his? his his death um, um it, it, it's a good question I, there's loads of theories um i mean i know the family so i'm, I'm not going to talk theories but i think um uh, put it this way it was a shock um but you know there's lots of you know interviews that he did before it happened where you know you could tell he was upset or, you know he, he was you know d doing a lot more work than he wanted to he, basically he wanted to be in the studio writing music but there was such demand for him you know doing 200 shows a year you know um was it was it was, it was, it was tough to do so I, I think if you look at the end of his career you could tell he was you know feeling overworked but i don't know it, it put it this way it was it was a shock that was definitely a shock. yeah yeah i i saw a photo of him on the afternoon of the day he i think it was the morning of the day he died and he was out like with tourists because he was a, in some hotel abroad, wasn't he? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Abroad. He's obviously from Sweden anyway, but yeah. And yeah. he was just like doing selfies with, with tourists and, and it was mm. like certainly look no, didn't look like a guy that was going to, I mean, I, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm I really, only ask really, because there's, but... it almost seems a dead cert to me that there's some weird shit goes on in the music industry, you know, well, it does. Not for sure. Yeah. I've been in it 30 years, but I think the, uh, but no, I mean, I think when it comes to 
to Avicii. There, you know, obviously there were some issues there. I, I mean, that's that's all. You know, I can't say anything beyond that really. But yeah, know, it was a course, shock, course. and I and I wish it hadn't happened. And you know, it was it's very upsetting. But you know, I'm 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 proud that you know I I got to spend a fair bit of time with him. It's not like we're best mates or anything, but you know, I was you know I made a lot of videos with him. We probably did ten or twelve videos actually, in all over the place, all over the world. Um, and it was an important time of my uh, of my life. So I, I look back on it fondly. But you know, last last thirty years I've been in music, man. That's been some crazy shit from day one. But <laughs> anyway, that's okay. another video. That's his another music, video. his his music's awesome to run to. <laughs> Yeah, um, and listen, I, I think, I, I don't know whether you called it on this, but, I, you know, as I said to you before, I'm in awe of you doing that run, you know, the 900-mile run or whatever. It's like, man, that's an achievement. i got to be honest with you. I mean, 360 is all right, but running 999 miles or something, I mean, I couldn't even begin to fathom doing that. But So congrats on that. I know it was a while ago. But oh, that's, no, that's really kind you say. Um. <laughs> Yes, it's really. Uh, I'm I'm a bit blown away, mate. To be honest, so thank you very much. My pleasure, sir. It's been been good. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry about the pig and the thunderstorm. Luckily, mostly that didn't show up. Hopefully, but hey, yeah. listen. There's how many people can get to say that they podcasted with Andy Ruffle and a pig? That's <laughs> that's what makes life interesting. Listen, yeah, listen, be- we're gonna keep in touch anyway because I, I think yep. the world of you, Andy, you're 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 um, you, vice versa. Yeah. Well, you've been so kind to me in the short time we've known each other. Um stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but for the fur- purposes of, of the tape, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> but no, ma- massive thank you. Thank you on behalf of all those people that I know I speak for when I say you are such a positive influence in our lives. And my God, I would, I, I just wish my son's generation have people like you, you know, people that are out there smashing it. Um, so no, thanks. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming on the podcast to our friends at home. There you go. We've just had another classic. So Much love to you all. Thanks for tuning in again. If you could like and subscribe, and then we can do this again. Ciao, ciao. Take care, mate. Thanks very much.